Marcus Cleaver. Before we head into the UK Supreme Court judgments from 2018, I was inspired by an email from a listener in Sweden to talk about a recent decision from the Court of Justice of the European Union called Tarico 2 that has caused something of a stir since the judgment was handed down in December. Before we can even get think about getting to Tarico 2, however, we need to take a look at Tarico 1 and work out what all the fuss is about. Ultimately, this case raises serious questions about the supremacy of EU law and some of the fundamental principles of legal process. Before we get into those heavy issues, the facts of this case fortunately centre around the much more pleasant subject of champagne. Mr Tarico is from Italy and used various fraudulent measures such as false documents and shell companies to obtain champagne without paying VAT. He could then sell these on well below the market price and thus created a distortion in the market. All simple enough at this stage but the problem begins to present themselves when it becomes apparent that under Italian law the limitation period for these offences is really quite short. This, combined with the fact that financial cases are very complicated and take a lot of time, means that for all intents and purposes, there is immunity for people like Tarico. With this in mind, and also because the distortion of the market is something that will affect the European Union, the court in Italy threw this rather thorny issue over to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Of particular note is Article 325, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which states that member states must take action to counter fraud and other illegal activities that affect the financial interests of the European Union. Furthermore, the judgment of Franson in 2013 confirmed that the collection of VAT falls within the remit of EU law. Thinking back through case laws such as Simenthal, there is a general principle that national courts are obliged to give full effect to community provisions, even if there is a conflicting national law. This is how the Court of Justice responded in this instance, as they stated that if the national measures are not up to scratch, then they should be disapplied without even waiting for the Italian legislature to act. Fairly straightforward at this point, but the contentious aspect of Tarico 1, and then Tarico 2 for that matter, was that this is not just some civil law case, but rather a question of criminal law, and so retroactively changing the law can make a huge difference between a person being guilty and a person, in this case, having their case time barred. At stake are fundamental rights under the Italian constitution, but also fundamental rights at a European level as well. The Court of Justice were not entirely ignorant of this and did briefly consider the principle of non-retroactivity under Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as under Article 49 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, before claiming that this does not apply here because it relates only to the time limitation and not to the actual offence or the punishment. At this point the local court in Italy had its answer from Tarico 1, but unsurprisingly the case worked its way up the Italian court hierarchy and eventually ended up before the Constitutional Court in Rome. The court still had a number of legitimate concerns about the fundamental rights of individuals under the Constitution, and so they went back to the Court of Justice for what would be Tarico II. In its reference, the Constitutional Court accepted the primacy of EU law but also noted that there are diversities within individual legal systems, and that maintaining this sense of national identity is also an important aspect of EU law. This probably gives you a sense of why this case is so interesting, and why I wanted to cover it on the podcast, as it combines EU law, domestic law, and fundamental human rights in a seemingly impossible clash. In the first instance, the Court of Justice recognised that Article 325 and Franson do impose certain obligations on member states in relation to VAT fraud. Furthermore, if it is necessary to do so, they should disapply national provisions. However, the Court also recognised the importance of legality and non-retrospectivity, not only within the context of Italian law, but also as part of a wider European legal order. The problem is matching these two important facts together, 
and this is where the judges really struggled. They essentially said that the duty to disapply a particular national provision can be waived in circumstances where it would create uncertainty in the law or place the defendant in a worse position. Why is this so strange? Well, it is basically saying that the national courts don't actually have to do something that they are required to do. This is clearly a step back from Tarico 1, but also goes against the recommendation of the Advocate General to the court, Eve Bott. The opinion of the Advocate General is worth briefly reviewing by way of contrast to the actual decision, because it takes a much harder line on the issues, and in particular the primacy of EU law, as an important concept. Bott accepts the concept of preserving national identities as well, because this is derived from Article 4.2 of the treaty, but rejects its application in this particular instance. Overall, neither this opinion nor the actual judgment, though, are especially satisfying. The Advocate General takes a very conservative approach that flagrantly ignores the careful political element that has to go into these sorts of decisions from the Court of Justice. Taking such a hardline approach might achieve a short-term victory for the primacy of EU law, but if the Court of Justice were to consistently take such a combative approach, it would only lead to resentment further down the line, and would undermine the European project as being one of cooperation. There are occasions when member states do have to be brought into line, but when bigger issues of constitutional law and fundamental human rights are in question, it is necessary to be more tactful and engage in a dialogue with the national courts. On the other hand, the judgment of the court is at best confusing, and at worst just doesn't make any sense. There was a clear determination to track back from the original decision in Tarico 1, but without admitting that the court maybe got it wrong first time around, and this is where the problem stems from. There was an opportunity here for the court to give a clear statement on the interaction between EU law, national constitutional law and human rights. It is true that they would not have been able to clear things up once and for all as this is an ongoing process that must be refined over time, but much more effective guidance could have been offered to other member states dealing with these same issues. Instead, this rather clumsy judgement undoubtedly points in the right direction by affirming the primacy of EU law, while also retaining a respect for both human rights and national sovereignty. But the framing of the decision is such that it leaves too much open for question. The Court of Justice has unlocked a door without preparing for what might be on the other side. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. We'll be back next week with a case from the Supreme Court, the first one of 2018. In the meantime, make sure to leave a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes. That's always very much appreciated. Had one recently from Natalie, so that was great. If you have any comments or questions for me personally, you can contact me through my website at uklawweekly.com. Otherwise, I will be back next week with another case. Bye!